Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Turin Trigista, and I'm uh, the deputy director here at PRIO, but also director of the PRIO Center on Gender, Peace and Security. I'm very excited to uh, see that so many of you have showed up here today. Uh, I was discussing with my colleagues this morning, I, and I actually think this is the first physical event that the GPS Center is organizing since February 2019. So we feel a little bit rusty. <laughs> But I'm also very excited that we are able to do this uh, as a hybrid event. So there are many out there also signing up and listening in and watching. So welcome also to you. And then I would also like to remind you that this event is going to be recorded and will be then posted online after the, after the fact. Now, um, the PRIO GPS Center has served uh, or is serving as a, a resource hub for for research, for teaching and training, for policy input, uh, and has done so for quite a few years. Policy and research on uh, the gender dimension of uh, peace and conflict. But I must admit that, in fact, although we have gender in the title of the centre, most of our work has actually been focusing on women. And, you know, reflecting on women's experiences in peace and conflict and making their voices heard. So it's thus a pleasure for me to welcome you to this hybrid seminar that is focusing on the engagement of men and for gender equality. And we asked the question, how can we better understand men and masculinities within the women, peace and security agenda? This event is the first in a series of three seminars that we will organize in, uh, in the coming months. And it's, it forms part of a new uh, strategic initiative here at PRIO, where the purpose is to explore how researchers at PRIO can further integrate perspectives around men and masculinity into their research and develop new ideas for projects and funding. And we hope that the outcome of this exploration will be new research initiatives and hopefully also new uh, collaborative efforts with both researchers outside of PRIO, with policymakers and practitioners. This is also why we have put together a panel here today with speakers representing these different groups of uh, stakeholders. For PRIO, it is important to put our research to work. We, we want to try and impact policymaking and what practitioners do in the field. It's always been important for us to bring these different groups together. Now, uh, I would like to give the floor to my good colleague, uh, Dr. Louise Olson. She is a senior researcher here at PRIO and also leader of the PRIO Gender Research Group. And she will chair the event here today. So please, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Turun, uh, for that really nice introduction. And also, uh, I also join you in uh, welcoming everyone here and uh, online. So about a decade ago, I took part in this international seminar for senior military leaders on women, peace and security and gender. And uh, this was a time when you could expect that quite a substantial portion of those that were participating in the course had been basically ordered to come there and their enthusiasm for the topic was varied accordingly. Now, as I'm sitting there around the table, as all these senior leaders are presenting themselves, I notice in particular one man, he looks almost grim and his serious face almost mirrors the, the dark green colors of his uniform. And I can also see by his insignia that he's quite senior. So if he is as negative as I think he is, He's going to set the tone for the rest of the group because he's quite high up in the hierarchy compared to the others. So when it's his turn to say why he's at the seminar, I basically hold my breath. But instead, contrary to my prejudices, he says with quite strong emphasis, I am here because I am so tired of the military being such a boys club. Now, as this can illustrate, understanding how masculine cultures, ideals and structures sort of form both some societal outcomes and some organizational behaviors has increasingly become articulated as important in the work for gender equality. And uh, uh, this is both in terms of, of promoting that kind of specific gender equality outcome, but also set in the context of actually producing more positive organizational behaviors and, and outputs and also 
for a peace and conflict researcher's perspective, importantly, in understanding how we produce peace. So in order to do that, we need to address a number of challenges that I think that this seminar is very well placed to, to, to do. So I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to our discussions on this, because one of them is sort of how we more clearly articulate men and masculinities uh, in the women, peace and security agenda and in, in gender work more generally. Um, because I think all of you can agree with me that women, peace and security came about uh, as the Security Council had not taken women's security concerns or participation seriously. They had had a male focus from its outset. In the UN Charter, when that was being formed, it was actually from the beginning said that you didn't really need to include gender equality and women's rights because that would follow automatically if the male situation improved. And I think learning from these 76 years, that is not the case. We need to more, sort of more clearly articulate how this can be done. However, as I think David Eurismith's research really also shows that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda has in a sense helped to articulate uh, women's security concerns and participation, but it has maintained an implicit focus on male roles and masculinity throughout sort of the everyday uh, work. Uh, and this has sort of had two consequences. One is that it looks like, uh, or it has become, that gender equals women. Just like Toron said, we tend to end up with that focus primarily. And the second, it also gives the impression that men can sort of choose whether or not to be part of gender equality dynamics. Uh, even though I think we need to start from the recognition that we are actually already in the same boat. And one of the things we're trying to address is that men have been occupying the upper decks. So this means that uh, we need to have gender inequality as a, a recognized starting point for including masculinity and, and men's role in the work for gender equality. That, however, brings us to the second aspect uh, into sort of both in terms of how knowledge can be turned, uh, sort of be, be better developed and also how it can be turned into action that we will also look at today. Because this also needs to recognize that even though gender inequality is a starting point, that doesn't mean that men, just like exemplified by the senior officer I mentioned, haven't really been part of engaging and trying to change existing structures and cultures for the same reason as, as this officer in terms of having a serious dislike of the existing conditions. Uh, and so really sort of trying to, to be part and jointly move forward. And the final perspective then that we will think about today is sort of how this masculinity concept should be understood. I think from a, a researcher's perspective in peace and conflict, men have also been primarily in focus. One of our classical works is actually called Why Men Rebel. And it's not until uh, quite recently that we have sort of taken a more increased interest in masculinity and male roles. And this has really showed a, a much broader span of, of different kinds of roles and attitudes and many of them actually being quite resistant to violence. So I think if we wrote the same book today, we could say that it could be called something down the line of why most men do not rebel, but more women than we expect to actually do. Because gender is therefore a central component here, that we shouldn't equate men and women with masculinity and femininity automatically. These are constructions. Uh, and I think that masculinity appear to play a central role for attitudes among both men and women. There's a brief at the back uh, also that, that could be read in, in complementary to David's research uh, by Eric Melander, Jackie True and Ellen Bjarnego that really looks at how masculine attitudes also play a role for violence. And Erica Forsberg and I actually find in a survey that women who hold unequal attitudes are actually as pro-violent as men who hold also uh, these kind of uh, ideas around masculinity. So it's really complex and uh, quite multifaceted when we talk about male roles and masculinity in peace and conflict and women, peace and security. So I'm really, really glad that we have such a distinguished panel here today that will help us iron out and, and, and develop uh, these uh, ideas. So I think that um, uh, one of the... Oops, sorry, I did my... Ah, yes. Um, this knowledgeable talent will sort of bring out both the uh, uh, research dimension, sort of help us iron out the different research components, and then apply this to practical programs and, and ways to move forward and sort of also look at the sort of the, the different components of what that can mean in practice. So first we will have a presentation by David Durismith, lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Sheffield University. Uh, and then I will ask the, the panelists to come up uh, to this stage. 
Uh, first, we will have Ole Andreas Lindemann, who is the ambassador to Afghanistan at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. Then we have Kai Martin Jorgsen at uh, CARE uh, Norway, Secretary General. And then we will have Kelly Fisher, research assistant here at PRIO, who focuses on masculinity. So we are very, very glad that you can all join us. So we will address three questions jointly. What is encapsulated in the idea of engaging men? Uh, and also what kind of intentions is in this complex idea? How have issues related to men and masculinities been articulated between women, peace and security work? And finally, uh, what are the practical programs and initiatives that has been successful or unsuccessful in uh, trying to increase men's support for gender equality? And what do these also say about masculinity? So after this presentation, I will uh, ask the panelists to join us on stage and reflect on each other's presentations. And then I will also open up for questions from the audience. Now, as this, as Turun said, is a hybrid event, asking a question, if you are here in the audience, means that you have to come up here, here on stage to this uh, microphone over here. Uh, and if you are online, you can then uh, ask questions in the chat and uh, Johanna Elvebakken will come up and present the questions here. So, uh, without uh, further ado, I therefore now give the floor to David and the presentation. Good morning. It is a joy to see you all in person in the flesh after COVID. Today, I'm going to be talking a bit about my research on men and masculinities within the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And I'm going to propose to you two main points. First is that there is no single engaging men and boys aspect of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, but multiple different approaches and interests which may or in some contexts may not be complementary to one another. And secondly, that because masculinities are so made invisible, so made part of the background noise of our everyday lives, that key aspects of men and masculinities in the women, peace and security agenda are often ignored. But first, before I do that, I'm going to outline a bit of the context of how we've gotten to this point, how we've gotten to having this conversation today and how it's been framed as engaging men and boys. The Women, Peace and Security agenda has always had a focus on men to some extent. However, they've been rarely named explicitly. What I mean by this is when you look at the key issues that the Women, Peace and Security agenda has initially intended to address, women's exclusion from peace processes, violence against women, the lack of support in post-conflict reconstruction, the issue that is in the room, although rarely named, is the behaviour of men. You see this explicitly in its origins in the women's peace movement, critiquing masculinities and men's behaviour. But in practice, the language of men and masculinities has not been included in most resolu resolutions around the women, peace and security agenda. <coughs> Over the last 10 years, we've seen a growth in more explicit recognition of men and masculinities in the agenda. Although in this context, the language has been somewhat curious. We can see from resolution um, 2106 that the phrase, the enlistment of men and boys in efforts to combat all forms of violence against women is included. Then in 2242, the important engagement of men and boys as partners in promoting women's participation in the prevention and resolution of armed conflict and peace building in post-conflict situations. Now, these languages are really interesting for a few reasons. The first one is trying to understand why there has not been explicit recognition in most of these resolutions around men and masculinities. And that is for two reasons. One is reticence from those involved in the women, peace and security agenda to include men on the basis that centering men might shift the agenda's focus from women and girls back onto the dominant subjects of peace and security, that being largely people like me. As one of the participants in a research study I did on this topic said, there has been a men, peace and security agenda from the dawn of time, but it's just been called security. The second concern has been from feminists from a very different direction, and that is by including men and boys in this space, we might be making the agenda far more radical. 
because to take masculinity seriously is not just to have a small ghettoized component of peace building initiatives or peace processes which are about women but to fundamentally start asking some questions about how the mainstream dominant approaches to peace and security normalize and invisibilize men's practices as if they are inevitable. For us to go beyond this, we need to shift from what Terrell Carver refers to as using gender as a synonym for women to including men and masculinities as a problematized analytic category, as one where we say the behavior of men is not inevitable, unchangeable, or unproblematic, but needs to be a topic which we can look at squarely in the eye. Now, 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 some of you might be thinking, this seems all very interesting, but where does the role of men as victims fit in with this? And this is where my first question around, is this even one agenda comes up? More recently in 2467, we see mention of boys as targets of sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict settings. And I'm not going to read the full text here, but this recognition quite explicitly that we need to consider violence against men and boys, particularly sexual violence, as a form of gender based violence. Now, this agenda, from my perspective as a masculinity scholar, is connected to a question about men's behaviour, men being the majority of perpetrators, although definitely not the only perpetrators of sexual violence against men and boys. But is it the same agenda to say we need to take seriously how men and boys are victimised in conflict? to an agenda which is about shifting their behaviour towards women, to an agenda which is about engaging men to not be roadblocks to women's own activism in achieving peace and security. These three components are related to one another, but sometimes are not perfectly aligned. So what's the international context of this? Well, there's a few things that have been going on, and I would say the first one is not what has happened with the formal resolutions, but the growth in key international actors working on masculinities in conflict affected countries. To a large extent, this agenda has grown in certain spaces as a response from demands on the ground, if we're going to use that somewhat problematic term. Women and men in conflict affected countries have been saying for quite a long time, the challenges we face are not just about abstractly including women, but shifting men's relationships with gender to make that possible and creating pathways for men to no longer be victimised and to be no longer stigmatised when they are victimised on the basis of their gender. You can see this work emerging both on the ground in conflict affected societies and through international actors like International Alert and the Geneva Centre for Democratic Control of Armed Forces at two different levels. One which has been about implementing practices within communities affected by conflict and another working with armed forces about how they approach gender themselves and trying to use a blunt term, make men more gender sensitive, although we might want to have quibbles about that later on. So with the international context, there is some clarity regarding the problems that we might want to address. Men are victimized in ways that are not recognized because gender stereotypes about what men are and how they're impacted by conflict. Men engage in violent practices and are punished for not doing so on the basis of gendered expectations about how men should behave. And men in positions of power and leadership create significant barriers for women's full inclusion in society in relation to peace and conflict. These are problems I think we can clearly articulate. But what does it mean to engage men in any of these and might these things look similar? A lot of the initiatives have aimed at addressing the attitudes of marginalised men and boys in conflict in relation to gender. But that seems to be quite a different set of agendas, for example, from working with military leaders who create barriers for women and girls. Some participants in the research that I've done are sceptical about this inclusion, with one of them saying, this whole men, peace and security agenda is about getting big old guys who have zero track record on gender trying to be the big hero. And you can see this with some of the criticisms around um, initiatives like the He For She campaign, this concern that the inclusion of men and boys is about men trying to make career moves. I think that's a bit too sceptical, but it's something that in feminist activism we should be concerned about. The next challenge here is from a different participant who said properly addressing masculinities would mean questioning the foundations of the institutions we build. It would lead to a fundamental questioning of the security sector and certain, how certain kinds of masculinity are celebrated by our partners. Now, this articulation is not just about addressing men's violence against women 
in conflict affected societies from the civilian population, but for example, would include the very many challenges that women who've worked in this space have articulated with men not taking their expertise seriously, with presuming a state focused understanding of security itself, with addressing the way in which power dynamics in the development sector are played out. These things are quite distinct from some of the problems we might want to address in comparison to men who are victimized on a, through sexual violence in armed conflict. So I'm going to ask you, when you came into this session thinking about the problem, who was it in concrete terms? Unfortunately, the area of engaging men and boys in the women, peace and security agenda has a problem with euphemisms. We like to talk in broad terms. We like to talk about toxic or problematic masculinities. Sometimes we'll talk about shifting men's behavior or engaging men. This rarely centers concretely on anyone in particular and often defaults to what I would argue are sexual and racial stereotypes about certain groups of men having problematic behaviors, which from this academic study of masculinities is often then used to justify other men's patriarchal masculine behavior. It's a patriarchal trope as old as time to say, I am here to protect you from those other men, the men who are the bigger problem, the men who are going to behave masculinities in ways that are more problematic than me, and therefore you must invest in my role to protect you. When I did my fieldwork in Fiji and Aceh in Indonesia, what this manifested as very often was the targeting of perceived moral failings of young stigmatized men as the main problem with um, men and boys in this space. For example, men's premarital sex, smoking, drinking, recreation activities, in the context of Arche, men playing too many computer games being the problem. Now, sure, th there are problems that we can address here, but the frame is always otherized. The problem men are always not the ones who are actually in control of society. Or as Michael Salter argues in his work on changing men's attitudes to gender-based violence in Australia, we ask the group of men who are least privileged under patriarchy to be responsible for changing it rather than those who are in a position where they get the most rewards from the unequal system. The challenge here that I'm going to propose is that we end up framing the engaging men and boys agenda as trying to fix men who have failed to be men in the right ways, and then enforcing another oppressive regime around what masculinity can be, rather than trying to establish or destable patriarchal understandings of men and boys behavior in general. The worst examples of this that we can see are the agendas that will say a real man doesn't use violence against women. The challenge with this, of course, being that the research would suggest that men and boys use violence against women precisely to be real men. The challenge there is not just about shifting the attributes and behaviors of some small external group of boys who don't understand how to be man enough and showing them the way by presenting middle class white diplomats as the preferable alternative, but instead trying to have a conversation more broadly about how masculinities have shaped the air that we breathe and the ground that we work on when we're talking about peace and security. In terms of practices, this leads to some challenges. One participant in Germany said he had been asked by a major funder, no one in the room, don't worry, um, to develop a checkbox list to how to spot toxic masculinity. And the example he was given was stereotyped ideas of violent Congolese men who beat up their wife and children. Now, sure, that, that, that is a problem, but the women, peace and security agenda and the scholarship surrounding it does not suggest that that is the problem. And that very often the problem are the masculinities which are respectable, which present themselves through intellectual expertise and exclude women through rational argumentation about the expedience of the moment rather than through verbose public displays of violence. This makes it difficult to interrogate the politics of change because of any large scale movement and instead centering individual self betterment to use the words of Henry Maternan and Charlotte Mertens. This can become a self help program for men who don't know how to be men enough rather than something that interrogates the way in which masculinities function as structural. The work in practice has some few different ones. And I don't want to be too negative because I think this work really does have some, some tremendous power and has had real achievements in making masculinities visible. There are a few kinds of initiatives that I saw as most visible in this space. 
First, you have what is, uh, I would think of as social norm change with at-risk groups of men. This is the kind of work done by Promundo, Sonke Gender Justice, and lots of the Men Engage Alliance affiliates. A lot of this work focuses on targeting men who are most able to be changed. Very often this is young men with the premise that their attitudes are more malleable than older men, engaging in small group work with them and trying to shift their perceptions on a number of specific vectors, for example, about violence against women, women's work, participation in public. You then also have a separate set of work, which is about working with vulnerable men who are victims of sexual and gender-based violence and armed conflict. And you see this from groups like the Refugee Law Project. And finally, you have the work with, with state militaries and institutions through gender mainstreaming, running workshops with men in the military, um, in the aid sector. And, and I want to quote Gary Barker in a publication from 2007 to give what I would see as the more positive spin on this, because I don't want to be too negative about it. Men and boys can and do change attitudes and behaviour related to sexual and reproductive health, maternal and newborn and child health, their interactions with children, their use of violence against women, questioning violence with other men and their health seeking behaviour as a result of relatively short term programs. So on the positive side, some of this work does show you can shift men's attitudes. We don't come out of the womb as oppressive patriarchs. Things can change, they can get better. And within this, there is a defence for this specific kind of approach. Gary Barker, in my interview with him, and this is a attributed quote with his permission, let's say we work in a community. There are men there and they seem to be using less violence against their partners, but they continue to be the ones who make household <laughs> decisions. And their income is 50% higher than their female partners, and they're not buying into gender equality. And here you're celebrating them for not using violence. Isn't that a low threshold? It's a matter of using context. Gender equality is not zero or one, it's a journey. We've at least got to stop using violence and, and that's okay. He still needs a little bit of celebration saying, isn't it great that you did it? Because he's feeling quite emasculated in the context of displacement. Now, I think from my perspective, there are two things we can take away from this. One is that these different kinds of initiatives have different purposes and to an extent that's okay. An organisation like Promundo is trying to shift specific groups of men's specific practices in a specific location. And it seems like some of the initiatives that they are working on can do that. I'm all for that, no problem with that at all. However, does that fundamentally remake masculinities that facilitate patriarchy and armed conflict? I would suggest no. Does it lead to structural shifts on a societal level about men's participation in the military, in militarism, in support for dominant forms of leadership, to conflictual approaches to resolving conflict? I would also say no. This kind of work also has the risk very often that it reproduces and recenters aspects of masculinity that we think are the problem. We, I mean me, uh, in this context. <laughs> very often this work works to solidify men's patriarchal attitudes about how they should behave, but to soften the edges. It is not a message saying it doesn't matter if you are a real man. A real man is not a category that exists or has normative value that we should be invested in. It's an agenda that says you are deeply invested in this gender role of being a real man. And then we can use that to put pressure on you to shift these couple of behaviours. There is value in that for those couple of behaviours, but is this initiative actually making steps towards unmaking the role of masculinities in this context? I would suggest that it might have the opposite effect. Teaching men how to be men in a way that says, don't be like these bad men, be like these good ones, might make them more invested in their gender role, not less. It might make those roles more solid. And yeah, in specific contexts, like Gary Barker says, that might be good enough because we are not working in perfect circumstances. This is not the radical feminist revolution that I might want to achieve. This is trying to stop specific kind of violence in specific kind of places. But that agenda may not be one which is commensurate, for example, with some of my colleagues like Jamie Hagan, who want to challenge the heteronormativity of the women, peace and security agenda and actually working with men and saying, now you all have girlfriends and wives, do you beat them or not? Might do work that makes it harder to address other parts of the work that we want to do. So there's a few challenges here that I'm going to finish with and hopefully not too depressingly. The first challenge I'm going to say is in, the goal of engaging men is often vague. 
and often intentionally vague. It's often used by organisations because more specific statements about the problems with men's behaviour are politically challenging, get communities offside, are unappealing to funders. But a message about the good change we can do with men and boys in a specific context, well, it's fundable, it's less likely to make people hostile towards the work that you're doing, and it might be able to be delivered in a short period of time. Great. But that vagueness means that we avoid the political challenges and difficult conversations that we might want to have about what are the politics of what we're trying to achieve here. And those political objectives are not always going to be the same. The Women, Peace and Security agenda is not one coherent body of work where we all agree about what we want to achieve. The work from those who want to shift military masculinities in the armed forces and the work from those who want to disestablish militaries and move towards pacifism are likely to not be similar. And that's okay. Let's have an explicit conversation about what we want to achieve and where masculinities fit within that. Second is a bigger risk and one that I think is a real challenge all the time in this space. We externalise patriarchy. The problem with patriarchy is always presented as some other man. As one of my participants said, it's not just the young guy smoking cigarettes on the corner that's the problem. It's my boss. And you see this from lots of women who work in these spaces. The problem is very easy to talk about when you're talking about some man of colour in a conflict affected society in the global south. But if you want to talk about the gender dynamics of the men in the room, that's much tougher. Third, that interventions rarely take a structural approach and are rarely scalable. That doesn't mean that they'd have no value, but interventions which target a specific small scale community may not reshape the entirety of society. But unfortunately, sometimes these initiatives are presented as if they do that. Finally, and I haven't had a lot of time to talk about this, interventions reproduce colonial heteronormative ideas around sexuality and around what men are. This is often about asking men in the global south to start looking more like middle class bureaucrats. And I think there are a whole range of challenges we can possibly talk about that at a later date. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, David, for raising so many important and, and thought-provoking questions. Uh, I now would like to ask the panelists to uh, come up to the podium, starting with uh, Ole Lindemann uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in order to save time, I will then ask uh, all the panelists to, to follow. Thank you. Uh, you can just stand here. Stand here, and then make my presentation. Okay. And then I go up there afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, dear all, uh, so happy to be here. Um, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I think I come from a more practical place. Uh, I'm an ambassador. Uh, I would like to bring some stories to the floor from uh, our work, my work with colleagues in Mali, but also recently uh, in Afghanistan until the embassy uh, were exiled uh, and we are now in Doha, but we are still continuing the work. Um, from my side, I think uh, what I can contribute with are some stories, practical stories about how we've been working, how we've been trying to achieve some of these things. Um, uh, first and foremost, how we have tried to um, build an agenda for the inclusion of women within the framework of women, peace and security. And I come from, you know, and represent, uh, come from a country and represent a government with a very strong mandate on this. And also, as you know, um, women, peace and security is a main priority for us in the uh, UN Security Council. And in itself, it's important to have such a, a mandate. I'll, uh, at some point later, I'll come back to some, some general uh, recommendations, maybe if there is time. But let me start with the, with the stories. Um, also, uh, with a question, I've been asking myself, and I think it's appropriate here in this forum, did my actions and, and the way we worked, uh, did it matter that I was a man? And, and uh, I think rather not. I worked as a diplomat, a person in a certain position, and, and I worked with a team, and we were both men and women, and we were talking to men and women. But of course, uh, being a man, I also reflected from time to time about sort of the do's and don'ts, uh, how to approach other men in leadership positions, 
uh, also women uh, from my perspective in order to be productive. The way we talk and build personal relations in order to, to achieve something, basically. Um, first, uh, from, from Mali, I remember sitting uh, with the uh, then peace minister uh, talking again about the importance of including women in the uh, structures of, of the peace, of the peace agreement. And I said, well, you know, Ola, all that is well and fine, but you're so fixated on this with women. It's always women, women. I don't disagree, but there are so many other things we need to fix first. There are so many more important issues. And I said, well, I'm honored to be fixated on this, and you should be too, because I am convinced that if you start with women, instead of ending with women, all the, all the issues will fall in place and much sooner than you believe. Well, he didn't believe me, but uh, anyway, <laughs> that was, that was a, a starting point. And then we um, invited, and that's another thing, I have not only a mandate uh, uh, from my government, but I have also ample resources and people uh, very keen to, to, to work on these issues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we were able to um, invite the entire uh, peace process, if you would like, uh, from Mali to Norway, uh, the parties of the peace, uh, to go to Northern Norway to look at how we, in our northern region, had similarities with their own northern re region. And the Tuaregs were very keen on this. And then I was presented with a, a list of delegates, all men, of course. They said, this trip will not happen. You need to include women. And I said, oh yeah, good. But do you really want us to take men out of the delegation? How shall we do this? Men are, after all, in the leadership positions in these, these um, Parties. So we decided also to just include, expand and bring women uh, on the trip. And that was fantastic. This was, they got along, as they say, like a house on fire. The discussions they had between women and men, but between women and men. In the bus, as we went from Katukaino to Karashok and around, we had ample time uh, in the car for this, it was fascinating to listen to. And I think that was the first sort of learning point, bring them together in some kind of an environment where they can speak together and, and create their own dialogue, um, sort of surmount some of these barriers that are there. And in another culture, they forget their own culture and they're simply just people together, but also men and women, of course. And then after this trip, uh, we decided this is not enough. We have to look at the, uh, the structures of the peace agreement. They had a uh, peace agreement since uh, 2015. But in the coordinating committee, the, the highest committee there, there were no women. In the technical um, committees, there were no women. And this couldn't be right. So we started the process. And, and again, then we had to work uh, down, down two alleys. First, to, to make sure that the coordinating committee was expanded. Because you cannot really expect men to invite in women if they have to leave the table themselves. You could have should have, but, but in reality, that makes it much more difficult. But we were able then to, uh, to talk them into expanding. And then they said, well, you know, Ura, uh, we are for it, but we will not uh, go there because it is extremely difficult to get all of these women to decide who's going to represent them. We cannot start doing that because for us, this will, in a way, be the end. Uh, we cannot do this in a peaceful way. And I said, you're not supposed to. You let the women do it themselves. That's, that's what we propose. So we hired a consultant, a, a mutually trusted person. She built a very good process. They did it themselves. We had all sorts of, of uh, women leaders in Mali saying, why am I excluded? And the answer was, well, you know, if you're truly a leader, you have to let someone else also get to the table uh, and have that seat. And, and we got there. We built a good process, they did it themselves, and when the result was there, no man could say, no, we don't accept this. So today, uh, women are, women are uh, included uh, in the peace process, um, and, and uh, they are also included, uh, as far as I know, in a way where they are not there to deal with women's issues, whatever they are, but all issues of peace. That was an, another important point. Let me then go to, to, to Afghanistan. 
we have been working uh, along the same lines in Afghanistan, and we are still also working on this now in exile, uh, a little bit differently. Uh, we have had some, some projects that I would like to, to just briefly mention. First, um, how women could talk to religious leaders in Afghanistan. Um, and there are uh, women scholars, the so-called ulema. They are trained and well-versed, just as well-versed in the Quran and Islamic law as, as the, the male religious leaders. So they had their own projects on how to meet them, find a middle ground and discuss the issues of the Quran uh, and also the tradition, Islamic tradition and law. Um, so we supported that and we found that uh, a very interesting approach. It shows also that the women has a part of all kinds of dialogue uh, in a society. Uh, also this one that we, we might think is, is, uh, is um, a privileged place for the mullahs. But the women are there, they have the education, they have the competence, we help to put them in there. Uh, and then also um, on, on victims, an important aspect of victims are that there are victims on both sides. Uh, of course, women are, are a vulnerable group, they are victims, but um, uh, also men are, as you, you said yourself. Uh, there was one particular project where they tried to give a voice to all the silent voices of the victims, bring them out. Uh, and, and then uh, published a book with small stories about uh, women, children, men, and what they had experienced from both sides. Uh, very touching, very strong, and, and something that has, had not been done. Then, of course, there were other, um, other um, initiatives of more, more political in nature, women's groups that were then talking on, on uh, peace building, and all the aspects of the nexus, humanitarian development, peace and security. Of course, women are included in all of these aspects, so they need to be there and, and discuss it. And now, finally, uh, we are um, trying to conduct in somewhat uh, difficult circumstances um, a dialogue with uh, the de facto Taliban uh, government. Um, we, we, we talk to them about humanitarian affairs, the humanitarian crisis is, is an imperative. We need to deal with it, uh, with them. But also here, the women aspect is, is very important. And, and this leads us then to, to talking to them about the importance of uh, including uh, women in, in uh, the way that they are working on this, that women humanitarian workers from the partners are accepted on the same line as men to bring the humanitarian uh, effort out. Uh, women can only speak to women, so it's important that they are there for that reason as well. And then, of course, the inclusivity aspect, which has not to be mixed with representativity of different ethnic groups, but inclusivity of women, different groups of society, minorities, also in the government. So this is a long conversation, and we have only started it. But here, we again speak to men. One last thing, these Taliban men, who we know have a problem speaking to women, when they meet the women on my team in Doha, in different setting, there are no restrictions. They talk to the women on my team in the most natural way. It surprises me every time. They are as outspoken as, as the women on my team are. And therefore, just to, to sort of conclude, if it's possible to conclude, I think that when we talk about masculinities, when we talk about engaging men, we must make sure that the best teams are those containing both men and women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ule, for those uh, really good examples. I think both in terms of working internally in one's own organization to visualize these structures and cultures and also what it means to, to, to negotiate the different spaces of, I think, what David would call the patriarchal structures also, both externally and internally. Uh, Kai Martin, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, for 
CARE, which is an aid organization, our point of departure is, let's say, the big picture at, for the state of the world. Women enjoy two thirds, approximately, of the rights um, that men have. Uh, 736 million women are subjected to violence in some form. Uh, women have less access to education and work. They earn 77% of what men uh, do. And we know that these um, differences, inequalities, they are also a source of um, wars, conflicts, and the absence of peace. So what we want to deal with is the structures that are uneven and also create this uh, inequality. But we have to work at different levels. We have to work at level of individuals, the more macro societal level, and also work with the patriarchal structures that are um, the reason behind these uh, inequalities. And we recognize that men can be both obstacles and all allies in order to, to, change, uh, to change this. So our aim is not necessarily to change men, but to change the world for women and for gender equality. Our aim is gender equality. Uh, equality. But we know that we also have to uh, work with and change both individuals and structures and society. I mean, personally, I just have to give this testimony that engaging men is such a dear concept to me, although I've heard all these <laughs> academic uh, <laughs> perspectives that I also, I mean, can uh, very much adhere to. Uh, but on a personal note, I before I joined uh, CARE um, September last year, I came from a position at DNB, which is Norway's largest bank. And at some point, uh, there was a recognition that we have to do something about gender inequality in our structures internally. So what what happened? Okay, we create um, an event, kind of a network and it's called Dream Women, <laughs> and it's where women meet. <laughs> okay, so there were wine and tapas after work, and I was like, hey, I think that gender equality is important. Can I join? I'm, <laughs> I'm also head of department on sustainability and stuff, so I think that this is part of our my agenda. No, you can't come, you're not a woman. <laughs> and I, I mean, today that's so, I don't know, 2002 or what it was. <laughs> Happily, I, th I think, because we need also to include men as uh, change uh, makers. And the way that we do this also in our work then um, in, in care is that we work at these different levels that I was talking about. And before August this year in, in Kabul, we worked, for example, also with religious leaders and small communities to ensure that women uh, were allowed to inherit and that women who were subjected to gender-based violence could divorce, as well also had access to justice and uh, health services. Of course, that didn't bring us to gender equality, but it did improve at least some thing for these uh, women. And in both Myanmar and Rwanda, we work with couples where men are violent. Um, and we see that there is a very str strong link between, I mean, absence of violence and um, more economic decision, I mean, joint decision making. Uh, also, when it comes to family planning, and also that you can even have these men as allies in order to um, to influence other uh, other men. Rwanda is maybe one of the places where we have been working on this for the longest time, where you're also able to measure it. And I hope that we can come back to that in the discussion. What 
is the impact that we want to measure and measurement and reports, etc., are very important in our uh, work. In some places, we definitely want to work with youth, with young people, because we see that um, they are, as you also said, I mean, very important for, for change. And in some areas, we have these dream men <laughs> uh, uh, fora or groups even. And I know that Hilde, who's here on the first bench, uh, who worked with Priya before, she has been uh, studying uh, Abatanga Mucho, which is a group of men in Burundi, uh, where they kind of become the advocates for other men and they travel uh, around to different villages and, and families in order to change men uh, themselves and also change family relations. And as, as uh, some someone put it, it's not about only economic decision making and etc. but even sex life has become better because I stopped beating my uh, my wife. I wanted to say at the last, also as part of our um, work, we engage with those who have power, political power and economic power. That is both in our field work, but also here in, in Norway. So. Why, when we work together with corporates, we also want to influence these structures that are fundamental for these inequalities that I just mentioned. And one example is that we work actively also now with the oil fund in order to make them integrate gender equality in their sustainability agenda. Because if companies around the globe also address gender issues, in the value chains, we know that that will also have global um, global consequences, at least, I mean, especially for the poorest and the most vulnerable women in, for example, Southeast Asia, in factories uh, there. And that is working on a more structural uh, level. And I saw it myself in the corporate world, but it had more impact when also men advocated gender equality. And I say, I mean, I say that also with some hesitance because it doesn't mean that, yes, men have to do that war in order to impact because women can change the world, but we need both. And today, DMB, the bank that I've worked for before, that it's being headed by a, male, a female uh, chair of the board and a female CEO. And I could say on, this is, shouldn't be, I mean, on the tape, but I, I presume that they have um, less the ability to talk so actively about gender equality and women's place because they are women themselves. It's like we are fighting for our own gender, whereas before where a male a CEO could do that fight, it was maybe, I don't know, um, more justified in some eyes and also had a bigger impact. So that were my remarks and I hope that we can also come back to some of it in the discussion afterwards. Thank you so much for that, both bringing up the, the structural aspect and also how the programming works to change uh, both individual attitudes, I think, and, and the, the larger structure to get the, the larger, uh, larger, broader impact. I think that's something we see more and more, actually, the larger processes and, and programs that address the, the fundamental structures. In order to, to move forward, I would actually like to those speakers in the panel that have already spoken to, to uh, go up and sit here, and then Kelly will give his uh, comments from here and then join the panel. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Louise. And uh, I just have to say, um, it's a, a real treat to uh, have this uh, discussion here today. It's been really interesting to hear all the different perspectives from David and Kai Martin and Ula. And uh, I think for me, just to share a few words kind of about how I think about this question of uh, engaging men for gender equality and why I myself am really interested in this topic and uh, one of the people who've helped organize this uh, is uh, based on a couple of different factors and um, but also thinking specifically to a moment that I had when I was growing up, uh, which is when I was uh, about 15, 
uh, a magical time in our lives. I'm sure we can all agree when we're 15, right? Um, and uh, I was just starting high school. And as a 15 year old, I'll admit, uh, I was preoccupied with uh, one thing very much in particular, which was I'm starting high school and I'm really nervous about meeting and talking with girls at high school. This was uh, an admittedly large concern I had when I started high school. And when I was registering for classes, I noticed that there was, uh, I could sign up for gym class and I could sign up for dance class. Uh, and I noticed that there were a lot of guys signing up for gym class and there were a lot of girls signing up for dance class. So as a wise 15 year old boy, I decided to sign up for dance class. <laughs> uh, and uh, luckily I learned from this experience that I actually really enjoyed dancing. Um, but I also learned from this experience that uh, a lot of my fellow guy classmates saw this as a good reason to bully or harass someone that uh, actually as a boy, you shouldn't be dancing. Um, and this was something that they uh, called me out on. And it wasn't until a few years later when I kind of reflected on that and thought more about that, which was to think this was clearly a moment in which uh, I was defying certain gendered expectations. I was stepping outside of what was seen as acceptable or the types of uh, things that are manly or unmanly for a boy to do. Uh, and I was being bullied for that. Um, and this would be uh, an important reflection because a few years later, I worked for a nonprofit in the US uh, where I went into schools at uh, giving presentations and workshops with students talking about different social issues. And I used that experience of dancing to kind of talk more broadly about gender roles and gender inequality in my experiences uh, from dancing. What was really interesting was that I noticed that whenever I talked about gender, gender inequality, all the boys in the room uh, either just stopped paying attention, uh, became kind of uncomfortable, like they were like, a, you know, I don't really know how to respond to this. Um, and this was really interesting to me. And uh, I was like, what is going on here? Why is it that uh, we have this dynamic where in which once we start talking about gender and gender inequality, uh, half the room seems to think that this is no longer relevant for me. Uh, so I kind of wanted to look a little bit more into that. I did my master's in gender studies at the University of Oslo. Uh, and was continuously greeted with surprise uh, as a boy who was studying gender studies. Um, and also that uh, because I wrote my thesis about uh, men and the way that gender shapes their lives, but in particular in migration experiences, where a lot of people said, this is really interesting. I've never thought about uh, men and gender uh, in this way before. And I highlight that because I think it speaks to two different points, which I think are really important for for this conversation. Uh, one is the fact that uh, just like my experience in gender studies where there weren't a lot of boys in that conversation, it reflects larger dynamics we see uh, in many different places where uh, work that is focusing on gender and gender inequality, research that's focusing on gender, uh, lots of men are not participating in this research or these conversations. And that in itself is a problem for a couple different reasons as elaborated uh, by everyone who's spoken so far. Uh, but also in my experience of writing my thesis about gender with men's experiences, um, it highlights how relevant gender is in understanding uh, the way uh, it shapes men's lives. And I think that's really true. Um, uh, it was true in the ex uh, with my, my own thesis research, but also really relevant <clears throat> for much of the research that's ongoing uh, here at PRIO in particular, uh, as a place that's studying peace and conflict. Uh, what is it about uh, gender roles or uh, using gender as a way to recruit men into conflicts. Um, what is it uh, about uh, when men are refugees in a refugee camp? How do ideas of what they have about being a man make it harder for them to deal with the vulnerabilities that they're facing there? Uh, so these are just some of the uh, things that you could outline and discuss that are relevant here. And um, yeah, and I know in my uh, work here kind of with this project, it's trying to get uh, that perspective brought in more to the research we have going here. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, now I will join the stage. <laughs> thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you also for all the work you've done in, in both the project and, and organizing this event. And thank you all speakers. Uh, I think uh, I have asked the panelists to reflect on each other's presentations, but as I I'll ask you to think about that a little bit more, I actually want to open to collect questions from the audience and online uh, as part of that. Um, yes, please. So you're going to have to come up uh, here to, to be close to the, the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Ulises Canchola. I'm the Mexican ambassador to Norway and I'm here, well, mainly because Norway and uh, Mexico are members in the Security Council. Uh, 
we pursue the same goals, particularly in the, uh, in the gender agenda. But also I'm here because I'm, uh, I'm curious and I'm among those who would like to learn more about what we're talking. Um, let me give you very briefly my, my background. Most of my career, I've been multilateralist. I've been in New York, in Vienna and Geneva, and I've been in these negotiations you were referring before. Um, parenthesis, I, I take a little bit harsh the comment that uh, in the UN, we, we've been very uh, lagging behind. When you take a look at the human rights agenda, well, indeed it was Eleanor Roosevelt who made the reference to human rights, but if you take a look at the charter, there is no reference to human rights. And still, yet, we developed a whole corpus to deal with human rights. So that reflects the spirit of the charter evolving and progressing. So that's what take uh, have us here um, working in order to, let's say, make a, be a better world. Um, then, curiously enough, and I'll come back to, to my question, my last posting was also in the Middle East. I was ambassador to Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran. And uh, based on that, I'd like to, to pose a question, uh, really, and it's uh, something I've been reflecting on. What is the, the relationship between masculine, masculinities and culture? And let me give you a concrete example, as just the ambassador was saying. Um, I was put to the challenge of learning a language in the Middle East, which was Farsi. What got my attention is, is that that language doesn't distinguish gender, mm. which makes it, to some extent, when you read, when you read poetry, uh, very, very powerful because of the erotic attractiveness of, of the language. But um, again, I don't want to go into the very detail. I'm not an expert. I'm just referring my experience. But uh, the language, since it doesn't have a gender distinction, one of my favorite words is a uh, husband or wife, which is hamsar, hamsarima, my, my wife or my husband. Hamsar comes from two different words. Um, ham, the same, sar, head, which means those who think with the same head. Well, to me, that's very poetic, but also very powerful because there's no distinction. There's equality, there's balance. Again, I don't want to get into the nuances. That's a very complicated region. But I keep thinking of that whenever I come back to, to that beautiful language. I assume Dari, which has a lot of Farsi as well, would have these kind of things. But at the end, masculinities, there is not such a single and consolidated concept of masculinity. But still, we can find some common elements. I agree with you, we are not trying to change the man but we're trying to make the world better, equal, to give place to, to gender. How do you relate these two concepts, masculinity and culture? Thank you again. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that really important question. I think now we have both the culture and also the, the generational uh, uh, aspect on the table. So many rich uh, aspects to discuss. Uh, I would therefore like to uh, um, go to the, the panelists. I don't know who would like to, to start with giving some reflections and also responding to that very important question. David, would you like to? I've seen you've been taking a lot of notes. So I'm, I'm uh, thinking you are. There have been so many good points. I don't want to miss anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the point on culture is really important. And I'm speaking as an academic rather than a practitioner. And I realize that there are really distinctions in my purpose compared to what other people's are trying to achieve. I would absolutely agree. Masculinity is not a unified concept. There are resonances. I would say, you know, in my understanding as a feminist, patriarchy is diverse in how it operates. There are commonalities. In terms of the language thing, this is huge. I mean, the, the, the way that we think about gender in a context like Norway or Britain or Australia, where I'm from, is not necessarily resonant with how it's thought about in other contexts. And this is what the last point I was trying to bring up around the sort of colonial or heteronormative framings of it, because we can so easily try and map what we imagine as masculinity about how men relate to a single monogamous partner in a family home. And that's what masculinity is. And everyone's like that. I think there are real importances of doing things in local context. And, and this is why in the work that I've done on violent extremism, I've really pushed back against this idea that there is a terrorist masculinity or a toxic masculinity, which is 
the model that terrorists engage with. I think that's a really dangerous idea for us because I think in these spaces around gender, when so much of it is invisible, one of the most dangerous things we can do is to think that we understand stuff and that it's common sense. And I, I absolutely agree on your point there. I would say though that because there is culture and there is difference, that doesn't mean that there aren't some common issues. And I think, you know, women in a whole range of different cultures will talk about men's violence as being a challenge that they face. And that doesn't mean that we can't have cross cutting discussions with differences, with, with different understandings. But I think there has been real power in women's conversations with each other about their experiences of violence. And I think there is potential there for men to talk about how our experiences as men has dehumanized us and hurt us and led us towards behavior that's not our best. And I think that can happen across culture, even though we don't share the same experience performance of masculinity. Thank you. Ole, would you like to go next? I also know that you had some recommendations. You uh, yeah, uh, but I'd love to, to make a comment also. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excellent question and remarks. Uh, um, because one of the, the, the most fascinating things I find as an ambassador when I'm, I come to, to another country is that I'm um, sort of catapulted into a different culture. And, and then to start to get my bearings and trying to understand the bits and pieces of that culture, also through language. And it's true, <laughs> they don't distinguish between he and she, for instance. So, so this creates uh, also a confusion, a lovely confusion from time to time. But you, you get in there in the new culture, you try to understand it because it's important if you're going to do your job. And what, what I, I always do, of course, and everyone does, is you try to sort of look, look for the differences. But that's easy. They are there. Much more interesting is to find the similarities. And they are there too. And and I've experienced in so different cultures as, you know, the Russian and then in, in Mali, West Africa and, and now Afghanistan, that men and women, although uh, we have different roles, masculinity is shaped, femininity is shaped, different cultural uh, enablers, they're are similarities which are the opening for the way we start conversing about these issues. So it's all, always possible. I find it remarkable that um, Afghan men and women who cannot see each other in the eye in, in Afghanistan, they can stand in Doha in a different cultural setting and look directly at each other and, and speak openly. So there is something there, um, but, but the cultural setting is uh, extremely important. Um, a couple of couple of uh, sort of uh, takeaways from my my, my life, uh, professional life, in dealing with this uh, is is that I, I first and foremost I, I define my role as that of a diplomat and and not as a man, but then then I try to build uh, teams of men and women, and what I've also done is that when we go out there and we have a broad agenda uh, from the humanitarian to to uh, peace building, the focus is too broad. I've learned that we, we should find some vehicle, some vector, some, some uh, point of focus. And actually, women uh, is a very good one because the, the situation of women, uh, the conditions of women in society is relevant to each and every one of them. So we made that uh, successfully sort of a, a, a um, um, point that we would start with the women and that the other things fall into place from that. Um, and then, of course, personal relations are extremely important uh, in the Afghan sense, never to lecture. We should not come from the West and lecture. But if we can find uh, agents of change so that they can do the change from within, that's, that's, uh, that's gold. And also, um, when you engage in a process, somehow that process should be uh, uh, about capacity building. But when you do capacity building, make sure that you also do confidence building. Confidence and trust are very, uh, very potent enablers for what you're going to do. Uh, so these are the, the um, lessons that I've learned uh, throughout uh, my personal life on this, and I just wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to take, since we are running out of time, the, the moderate prerogative to say that since 
we ran into some some technical issues starting that uh, we're going to take a few more minutes to to conclude because i'm really interested to hear all the panelists so okay, martin please well just a couple of reflections one is that i'm now thinking that maybe we should also and maybe especially academic world should look into the the language that you also use i mean especially for us that come i mean that work in the field i mean we might take concepts or more the linguistic concept with us that could also be a kind of a, a hindrance for i mean making the change that uh, we seek. I mean, it's because it's not only about how men look at women. I mean, there when men beat women, they often also beat male. Right. Uh, so it's all about, I mean, violence and use of violence and intra uh, personal relations in general. So maybe we should also, I mean, attack it in some way. I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking that this is an interesting a uh, thing to look look into and that leads me to the other part that i'm really hoping for in your next paper because i read <laughs> with a great interest your paper uh where you also made references to to care's uh work on on this and that is what should we what is the impact and the change that we mm. should strive for and we i mean we of course we count our activities how many men and women have we met and dealt with etc and uh, but what is the societal impact mm. that we should measure? And we do that a lot now when we are going into a new phase where we're going to, to measure our, the impact results. I mean, and when it comes to attitudes, mm. how do both men and women look at, I mean, different uh, setting situations and, and other individuals? Uh, and what are the I mean, good questions and perspectives mm. that we want to to change because it's not about our activities and our work in the field. I mean, we want to make change that remains long after care and other NGOs uh, out there at both a individual and a more structural mm. context. So in next next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so okay, much. Kelly? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's a, a really great question. And I think this um, to this point of masculine in culture and kind of the point that David was kind of making a little bit is that uh, there's a lot of intention behind just using the word masculinities uh, in itself, which is that very often when people maybe sometimes talk about uh, masculinity, they kind of refer to it in this singular sense. You know, there's a crisis of masculinity. Uh, there is a toxic masculinity without really thinking about or reflecting on the fact that, you know, there are lots of different ways of being a man uh, and thinking of it more in a plurality. And of course, that is culturally specific. That's uh, time specific. That's specific of just the four of us, you know, being on the stage together versus being in a really large um, room together. Uh, so I think that's kind of one thing I was uh, thinking a little bit about uh, with that. And especially this uh, this contextual point. And I know that uh, one of the quotes I really liked uh, that David had shared was um, this work, and especially in terms of engaging uh, men for gender equality and thinking about uh, masculinity uh, is uh, very much based upon what is the context and the situation that you're working within. Um, so yeah, so I think those are some of my thoughts there. May I make one last very brief point? Yes. Just want to say that this is the first time in a very, very long time that I've been in an old man panel. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually deliberate. So. Yes, I understand that. <laughs> different male perspectives and, and uh, works uh, in this area. And I think uh, to conclude, since we are out of time, uh, to engage, according to the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, is to captivate and to fascinate. And, and I really think that our panelists have, have really succeeded in doing that today. So I would really, really like to conclude by warmly thanking you all for, for coming here today and to all of you in the audience who, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm sorry. Um, but thank you so much for your questions and engagement, and, and it will be possible to talk to the to the panelists afterwards. I'm sorry about that. Um, and I, I also want to conclude by thanking Kelly Fischer and Johanna Elvebakken for your work in, in uh, setting up this event. So thank you so much for that. So with that, I close the seminar. Thank you. Thank you.